Now I will call to order our regular scheduled meeting. Um, so we've done the, the Tununu piece. Uh, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um. Don't Sorry. Have I uh, people could look at their own flags if you don't have one. There's a lot of flags here, okay. multiple flags. Gotta okay. love Google. Okay, <laughs> all right, y'all ready? Um, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the, the flag of the United States of, the United States of America. America. To the Republic, for which it stands, one nation, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have amendments to the agenda? We um, we do actually acceptance of the funds um, as an agenda item. Okay, is that new business? Yes. Okay, and then. Um, we yeah. have an we have a student request um, under non-public. Okay. And then I think Rochelle, you emailed about one, right? Yes, I'd also like to add talking about um, masks at school. Okay, so that's probably under old business. So I'll add that there. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Um, all right. So we are up for our public first public comment. We have two of these in every meeting, one at the beginning of the business and one at the end of the business. You're welcome to comment on agenda items. If something's not on the agenda, you can bring it up, but we won't comment on it until we have time to review. Um, we won't talk about issues around student and family privacy rights. Please be civil. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much it. There's a whole policy to meet up on it. So if you want to speak, um, Raise your hand. It's either under the reactions or under the participant flag. And Nicole is very sharp and very quickly. So go ahead, Nicole. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question and I, I apologize if it's been discussed, but I don't believe it has. I was wondering now that the kids are back full-time in school, one, how come we can't go back or let me phrase it this way. Can we go back to regular school hours in the sense of their normal length of a day? Because academically, kids are struggling. Even kids who are usually doing really well in school, they're missing out still on a, you know, a decent amount of instruction time. So that's my first concern is how do we get them back to that regular length of day? And two, if we can't, what are the specific reasons why we cannot do that since they're back in full time? Thank you. Okay. Um, we may or may not be talking about that when we update. Sorry. So because that wasn't on the agenda, I might not have it all. I, I have a sense. Um, um, but um, do we have anyone else who wants to make a comment? No. Okay. I messed up. It happens. Um, we have a couple of excellent presenters who have to leave at 6.30, so I wanted to move that up to this, the top of the meeting, and I forgot to do so. So, Jess, could you bring your presenters up? Sure. Um, so, I've got Kirsten and Oliver here, um, and before they start, I just wanted to say that they're the third, they're third grade students in Mrs. Rauscher's class. And you're going to hear that Mrs. Rauscher's class has been doing some amazing work during their recess time. I originally was going to ask them to read their class persuasive writing assignments, but we all felt that their short presentation would not only speak to their persuasive verbal and writing skills, but would also speak to their service to the community. Please know that these two outstanding students represent a whole class of students. And so Kirsten and Oliver, could you unmute and let me know once you've unmuted? I'm unmuted. Thank you, Kirsten. Oliver, did you unmute? Yep. Okay, Kirsten, are you ready to go? Yep. <clears throat> Oliver, are you ready to go? Yep. Hey, take it away, I'm done. 
Students in our class saw trash on our playground. More and more of us started to pitch in and clean it all up. The earth can't help clean itself, so we help a lot. I can all, I also clean around my house and in the woods. So every week there is more and more trash on our the playground. So we keep cleaning it up during our recess. Some kid some kids play during recess, but most kids in our class would rather clean our playground. When it was all clean, when we couldn't pick up more, I wrote to Miss Potter. Here is what I said. Dear Miss Potter and Miss Cornwell, Miss Rogers' class has been taking care of our playground by picking up the trash, and we have been wondering if we could go outside the fence where there is a lot of trash and where there is aren't any where we aren't allowed to go and pick up some trash because there's a bunch. Sincerely, Miss Rush's class. Miss Potter saw poison ivy and pricklers. So she said we could design something like a claw or something instead of going behind the fence. So I held a meeting by the bench at recess and we decided on some things to use to pick up the tr trash instead of going behind the fence. This is what we wrote to Miss Potter. Dear Miss Potter and Miss Cornwell, here are, here are some things we might need. At least two long claws, two or three fishing nets, definitely a step stool, maybe some duct tape. If you can find it, a wooden pitchfork. Miss Rousher thought if we all wear jeans, if that would make a difference and not be able to feel the prickers, Miss Rousher's class. We are working with Miss Potter to buy the items and materials to do it. We wrote to Miss Potter because we learned about persuasive writing and because we want to take care of the earth. That's it. Wow. And not only did they do that, they also, they also last night wrote on their own time, they decided to write um, a little speech to do over the announcements so that the students would learn not to put trash on the, on the playground. And they read that over the announcements this morning and they were extremely polished. They were, they were so good. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I am so impressed that you have, for so many things, I'm so impressed that you have helped keep Center Woods beautiful. So thank you. And I'm really impressed at your, at your writing style. That's just really impressive. I do have a question. Do you have the supplies you need? Uh, no. Not okay. yet. Not yet? Yeah. yeah. So you still need a big claw and you need some duct tape? No? We don't need duct tape. Okay. You need fishing rods? Oliver, you had some some things that you need, right? Uh, yeah. Why don't you tell her what they are? Uh, I wouldn't... Speak up. Two long claws. Two long claws. Two long claws. Fishing nets. Two fishing nets. Okay. And a, maybe a wooden pitchfork. And a pitchfork. Okay. I bet you we can make that happen. So we met today and we did order a long claw. Um, and we were able to find a step stool. Um, Kirsten and Oliver, remind me. Oh, and instead of a net, what are we using instead of a net? A bucket, like a, oh. a waste bucket. Okay. Very smart. The only thing is we're going to try this, and if it's not long enough, we may need other things. Okay. Let me know. We have a barn full of stuff. Uh, any other board members want to say anything? 
Well, I think that is absolutely fantastic. Having taught third and fourth graders with their persuasive writing, I would use your both of yours as a mentor text. So bravo and bravo to both of you. Yeah, I'm so proud of both of you for having so much pride in your community at Center Woods and for being so brave and presenting. I think you guys did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you both for helping the earth. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Looks like some great work you guys are doing there and hopefully you have all those tools that you need to get the whole job done and it looks like you also are proactive in letting people know that they shouldn't be throwing trash over there either. So that was a really great idea as well. Thank you. Thank you. I should unmute. Um, uh, do I have a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Do we have any additions, changes to any of the minutes? Can we do them um, just separately, just because I wasn't at the one on the 8th? Or, yeah, sure. And I was only at part of the training. Okay, that's sure. We so can do that. I just don't want to vote for this because I have no idea. If yeah, right. of course. That's fair. Okay, so um, let's... Uh, Christine, do you want to split your motion into three motions? Sure. I just, I can't pull up the, the drive. So I don't know the dates right now. I yeah. I'll, I'll, so it's the, the training on the 23rd, the board meeting on the 23rd, and then the emergency meeting on April 8th. And we didn't have any notes from the, the training, correct? No, it's just, it, so it's, it's just the board thing. That, yeah. Okay. So I'll make, motion, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes from March 23rd board meeting, please. Okay. And we had a Second, I think we need to do three because of the training actually has a small section to it. Okay. The minutes, but if you if you split yours into three, you just and then who was that? Sarah? Yeah. It was, yeah, you seconded it. Then I'll just go, I'll do the, the three votes. Mm -hmm. So um so the roll call vote to approve the school board training minutes. Uh Christine? Yes. Daniel. Yes. Sarah? Yes. Rochelle? Abstain. Abstain. And Wendy, yes. Okay. So the we're school board meeting, Christine? Yes. Uh, Daniel? Yeah. Sarah? Yes. Rochelle? Yes. Wendy, yes. And then the April 8th school board meeting, Christine? Yes. Daniel? Yeah. Sarah? Yes. Rochelle? Abstain. Abstain. And Wendy, yes. All right, under communications, I know we had an email from Holly Shelley. Is there anything else, um, Jackie? I was not copied on anything else. Oh, okay. Sorry, I will send you it for your minutes. I was copied on, uh, oh, on Holly's, okay. Holly, okay. Yes. All right. Um, anybody else on the board have anything that needs to be added in as communications? Not communications, but in regards to um, the public comment a little while ago, mm -hmm. is that something that we're going to put on a future agenda or address? Yeah, I was going to ask um, when we get into the first day of school. Okay. Uh, we might talk about it. I, I think it's due to we have to we have a bunch of logistical issues getting people to. Okay, thank you. But yeah, we should. Um, anyone else for communications? Okay, person scheduled to appear before the board, PTO here? They are, okay. 
I believe I saw Tanya's name. Let's see. Yeah. Were you at the meeting yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm here. Hey. Sorry, I'm driving. <clears throat> Uh, yes, we had a PTO meeting uh, yesterday. We are planning a golf tournament um, in July that is um, being planned by Rachel Freyhurst. So we're hoping to use some of that money to offset the cost of field trip. Um, and then we also have Teacher Appreciation Week coming up. So we are looking for monetary donations from families so that we can purchase um, uh, individually wrapped treats and things like that instead of having donations come into the school. And I think that's all we have. Thank you, and thanks for coming. Um, okay, so committee reports, curriculum. Rochelle and Sarah, did you have a meeting this month? The meeting is tomorrow. Oh, oh okay, good. Um, policy, yes, we have some policies later in this meeting, and then we have more next month. Uh, facilities, Rochelle. Um. I'll, I'll speak on this. So we, we've met twice since the last meeting um, because of the, the timing with the uh, vote last month. Um, and so the first one, we did a meeting um, starting the discussion around Center Woods Capital Improvement Plan. Um, so we're trying to make those meetings um, move towards the goal of having a, um, a, a solid capital improvement plan and, and putting down everything on, putting everything down on paper. Um, and so that will actually circle around a little bit in our conversation when I get to the reconciliation. Um, and then we did the same with the second meeting, but for where middle school, um, only that one was not well attended, so it was pretty short. Um, so we, we hope to revisit that in future meetings. Wendy, you're muted. I'm going to stop muting myself. Okay. So uh, community relations, we have, um, the, there's a lot of discussion around the John Stark election, which, which is coming up. Uh, we also ha are, have started um, ask a school board member a question. So on May 6th and May 7th, we have an opportunity to call in and ask any school board member who happens to be there from the SAU questions. Um, the, uh, how you access it will be on the SAU page. See. What, time, what time is that at? Um, there's one that's a morning and one that's an evening. So let me bring up my email so I'll get it right. Friday is at 10 a.m. Uh, Friday, May 7th. Thursday, May 6th is at 6.30 p.m. I can get Patty to send y'all um, invites. Please. Thank you. Yep. Good. Um, Daniel, how's transportation? Uh, I was looking actually to see I I either missed it or I didn't see anything scheduled for it. So I'm not sure if if I just need to I only saw like a list of, of which had a bunch of the other different groups, but I didn't see that one for some. Yeah, transportation probably, specifically. Go ahead. Sorry. Probably didn't miss it because I didn't have any meetings last year. Yeah, they don't tend to have meetings, they tend to have reactionary meetings, like if there's something going on, but so no news is good news. One of the things we've talked about for the future is to do that transportation study. And if, if we engage in that, there'll mm. be more regular meetings, but um, this year didn't seem like the right year for that. Yeah. Um, so kindergarten, Sarah, has anything happened there? No, but I can speak to it if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, so my next stop is to, um, to connect with Sarah. So what I've done since our last meeting is review all of the um, work that was done in the last couple of years, uh, very thorough work. And uh, I'm excited because there's a lot of groundwork there. And, um, <clears throat> and in reality, a whole not, not a whole lot has changed since the last time. Um, so my next, I, I needed to get a scope of, you know, how many meetings we needed and, and what, what to, to do first. So my next uh, step is to meet with Sarah and schedule a series of meetings that she can, doesn't conflict with her schedule and um, design, design our next steps. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so next negotiations. We 
um, did not do assignments on that one last month, um, but now because we have the intent to negotiate from the WEA, we need to figure out who's going to do um, teacher negotiations and who's going to do para negotiations. We need two board members on each one. Um, it really helps if you have some experience because it's a it's um, it's an interesting, fun experience. And Jackie will be there too to help if you have questions. So um, I think unless there's a bunch of burning desire, I was thinking I would I would offer to do the um, the teachers contract again. Uh, that was that was positive. Um, Christine, did you have any thoughts? Um, I'd like to do the if since you and I were the ones that negotiated last time, I think it might be wise for each of us to go on one of them since both of the contracts are up. So if you're going to do the teacher contract, I'd like to do the the paraprofessional yeah. contract. Okay, great. Will you be lead negotiator for para? I will try my best. Okay, they're a great group. That'll be easy. And Jackie, you're in on the paraprofessional one also. Okay, good. I just need a go-to person. <laughs> Okay. And um, the, they contact us like the WEA will when they're ready? Yes. Yep. Yep. Great. Okay, she might be here. Okay. So then we need um, some of the other board members to be the backup person. So you come to all the meetings for negotiations um, and help us negotiate but um, and learn a lot about the process. For the, other, the remaining three board members, do you have a preference to which one? I can help you with the teachers. Okay. I did the um, pairs last year, so. Oh, right. All right, so Rochelle and I will do teachers. Okay, and then um, Sarah or Daniel, um, would you be willing to help with the, the pair negotiations? Yeah, I, I don't mind helping. Okay, great. So Daniel will do para with Christine. Great. Okay. Um, then the last committee report is wellness and safety. Christine? Yeah. So um, I met with, uh, or the CWES wellness team met, and the focus was field day. Um, I'm super excited. I wish I was at that school to be experience, experiencing this. They're going around a New Hampshire theme. Um, they're going to be using, I believe, some of the materials that they were able to get for um, recess. They're going to be incorporating into different centers where the kids are going to go. They're still going to be um, in their cohorts. Um, their April Wellness Challenge is sharing recipes. And I guess there's a beautiful OT um, bulletin board in the hallway. And um, they're, I'm going to be um opening a motion jackie do i do the motion now or afterwards for the funding for the field day um you could i mean i think it's up to the board um but you could do it now if you wanted okay so i'd like to make a motion to allot two thousand dollars to each of the schools which is what we've done in the past in order to purchase what they would need um to do the field day for the kids so that would be um for Center Woods and then also the upper elementary and middle school. A second, one day seconds. Uh, do we have any discussion? I just have a clarifying question. So would that be a total, so are, would that be a total of $4,000 or are you saying 2000 for Center Woods upper and 2000 for the middle? My, under, 2000? my understanding when I, cause I also met with the middle school and we were talking about, um, Field day was there, but also the 5K, but the um, field day, it sounds to me like the upper elementary, and I think Sean's still here, upper elementary and middle school do it together. So I think they share it, but if I'm wrong, Sean, I can change my motion. We do it together. I would respectfully request perhaps a tiny bit more since we are serving a larger population of students. So maybe not to 2000 each, but maybe splitting the difference. You are correct. We share many items, but many items are consumable. So we are putting more students through. But I completely understand if the board is wants to keep it at two and we are thankful for any and all help. Do you think three would be enough? That would be lovely if that's what we could um, encumber for the two schools in the one building. That would be fantastic. Thank you for that consideration. 
So Wendy, could I amend my motion to, um, I'd like to make a motion for $2,000 for Center Woods Elementary School and $3,000 for the Upper L and Middle School, please. Yep, I'll still second that. Okay, more discussion. Okay, um, so roll call vote to accept um, the don accept offering the money to the schools for the, the wellness days, Christine? Yes. Uh, Sarah? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Daniel? Yes. And Wendy, yes. And related to that, is that the day that you're doing the, the 5K that on that day? The five 5K is different. Um, okay. The field day, they're looking at the middle school for June 17th. Um, I guess at the elementary, I think they're looking for um, June 2nd, 3rd or 4th. I don't know if they're spreading it out per grade level. Um, but the, the 5K at the middle school is actually going to be May 21st at 4 p.m., getting the bibs at 3. Um, and they're right now, as of the meeting Friday, they had about 30 participants. So they're hoping that more people will join. Um, I'll be volunteering. So if there's anyone who doesn't want to run, <laughs> if they, they do need some help, um, they do have a grant from um, Delta Dental for $500 to go towards the timing company, which is more than half. Um, some of the prizes to entice the teachers, I guess, is they're, they're, um, going to do a free jeans pass mm. but it, having gone two years ago to watch my daughter it was a lot of fun and they are going to try to spread things out um, but since I guess it's not as tight as when they first started talking but they are going to keep um, guidelines in in mind so the more the merrier uh, the sheets did go home with the kids I do believe that you can you can get it on the website also um, to sign up but it's ten dollars now 15 to sign up the day of and you get a t-shirt if you sign up ahead of time and that jeans pass is a huge deal. <laughs> For those of you who are not teachers like myself, that means you actually get to wear jeans to school, which is awesome. Okay, great. Okay, administrative reports. Um, Jess? Sure, great. Um, so I just have a few things to add. Um, first of all, I just wanna share that last week was a little bit more hectic than I had planned. And the, the time that I had reserved to write my board report was consumed quickly by other matters. And so one of the things that makes a strong team is the ability to be able to fall um, and ask uh, another teammate for help. So I just would like to thank Jackie Co. I'm sorry, Jackie Cornwell, sorry. And, to, and also Jackie Co, of course, but Jackie Cornwell for really stepping up. And she actually wrote the board report this month. Um, because that was one thing that I had to take off my plate. So I, I really would like to appreciate that. Um, also, if I could, I would like to um, just talk briefly about arrival and dismissal because I think it might help with the discussion that was brought up earlier. Um, and so I agree with Nicole that I would love to be able to have um, increased instructional time whenever possible. Some of the roadblocks that we're up against um, is that we, um, in a, during arrival, we have to check in every individual student to see if their screener is done before they go into the classroom. And so a little over 300 students takes a little bit. So we've got it down to 30 minutes, slightly less, depending on when buses come in. Um, we are, we're, we, even this morning, I was on the phone with the bus company about even bringing some of the buses in a little earlier. Because as soon as students arrive, as soon as they, they put feet in the building, um, once they go through check-in, which takes usually four to five seconds, they're in the classroom and the classroom teachers do have activities set up for them. It's not just, um, just arrival. It's actually that there are things that they are working on. Um, and then also interventionists uh, try to steal that time to be able to work with students. Dismissal is where we might have some potential wiggle room. Um, because we already cut dismissal. We, we started the year with a longer dismissal and we actually cut it down because we're actually getting better and better at it. Um, the reason why I didn't want to make a change 
recently is because knowing that kindergarten is going to be absorbed into our, uh, our PM dismissal, I knew that that was already going to be a, um, a big change for those students. And that we were going to have to potentially rework some of the, the routes. And at the same time with that happening, the middle school was also working on their routes. And we wanted to see that play out and, and build into new routines. We have the potential though of being able to increase instructional time, um, no more than 15 minutes. Um, so we are looking to ease our way into that. But if we have to continue, if the guidelines remain the same, we have to have some wiggle room on either end of the day so that kids aren't in big groups coming into the coming in in big groups and leaving in big groups. Um, so I hope that helps answer that question for this year um, and what it means for next year, I think, is still something we are all looking forward to working together on. Any questions? Any board members have questions? Okay, so my only question is, how, so how did the first uh, few days go? There were bumps. Uh, yep, bumps? There were some, yep, there were some big bumps. Um, we, we have um, the students that per require transportation are not conveniently located in the same area of town. <laughs> um, and so, um, and the schedule may change each day depending on the routine. So we're working through that. And I must say that the bus company um, has been, I mean, I, yesterday I called them and said, we have to have another bus because the route can't take two hours. Mm -hmm. And they were able to work and get me another bus today. Of course, that made it, that also was hard for parents because they got used to a schedule yesterday and it changed today. Um, so I know that our, our, our dismissals are a little, still we're working through with the kindergarten, but each day we're getting better. And, um, and I, I just, it's a, it's a lot, it was a little bit more work than I anticipated, to be honest, even though it's just one class. So I, my hat goes off to Sean um, and knowing what she must have gone through because I have a portion of what she had to do. But it, having the kids here five days a week, we're going to see that consistency. Um, and I was really happy to work with a strong kindergarten team who was able to accommodate almost all of the parents' wishes in the schedule. So we're working through it. Right. Yes. Can I just clarify, your, the transportation hiccup was the middle of the day run? Yes. Yep. Yep. It's this, it's, it, um, is the, it's the students that don't, that are not absorbed into our regular dis arrival and dismissal. Gotcha. Thank you. Sean. Um, I'd just like to update you on a few things that were not in my board report. One is both our boys and girls had their first games today, boys baseball, girls softball. We um, came out victorious in both of those. Our boys won two to nothing, played really well. Our pitching by Mr. Philbert was amazing. And our girls actually won 20 to one. So um, some amazing games going on and we are thrilled that um, we have been able to go back to a bit of a more traditional season and my hat's off to Kristen Lundeen because we had some transportation issues and we've really had some creative ways of solving that so we could continue with this season. So I'm thrilled with that. I heard the 5K mentioned. I do also wanna tell you that t-shirt will be two designs from two of our students. So um, maybe I can get a mock-up of that to show you even before it comes out. They are absolutely amazing. I'd also like to thank um, John Stark for helping us both with transportation of our athletes, but also with um, collaborating with us over our eighth grade promotion dance. So we are incredibly excited that that will actually occur for our eighth graders at John Stark under the tent that's already being rented for their prom. And they're even going to share, we're going to um, combine our decorations so that we come collaboratively together 
with the prom committee and the paraeducator in our building, Erin Barrio, who tends to lead this um, drive for our eighth grade promotion dance. So it's so exciting. And I think our kids, once they get word of how incredibly this is gonna be to actually have your promotion dance at the high school, there's just a beautiful like juxtaposition of them actually promoting up to that school and their dance being there. So those are some wonderful things. Um, I know it was a relatively long um, school board report, but what we were trying to do is give you a flavor of what it might be like if you were to actually walk through our building. So that's why there were so many pictures, you know, that trying to just, again, give you a taste of what a visit might be into our building and all the fantastic things you would see going on. Um, I will, if the board wants at this time to just reiterate some of what Jess said about our staggered and arrival and dismissal. Particularly in our arrival time, our teachers always have either bell ringers or some other activity that students are participating in as they come in. Our dismissal, we've actually gotten down to 20 minutes. We, are, we have bumped our dismissal a little bit, so we're not starting to 135. So we are trying to utilize as much of that instructional day as possible. And as Jess said, in our building too, some of our students have um, been given almost a specialized schedule in that we're asking them to be in the very first arrival, even if they're not alphabetically, so we can start some instruction in small group or one on one with those. And the same thing at the end of the day, we have some parents not coming to the after the very last dismissal to lengthen that instructional day for some of our small group and one on one instruction. We did when we were making plans for our five day opening. I did have some long dialogues with the bus company about what it could look like if we tried to do that full day without staggered arrival dismissal. We even did a car count to see how many cars would try and line up to drop off if we were coming at the same time. And for a couple of those reasons, it was not at the time something that we could move forward with. Um, we would every morning have cars well out onto 114 if we were doing a one drop off. And so um, I know we don't like to look at logistics over education, but that's why we're trying to utilize that drop off and pick up time as best as we can to also meet educational goals with our students. Um, and that's what I have for you. So how was your first couple of days? Um, actually, our first couple of days went um, fairly well. We were still worried about drop off because so many parents have agreed to transport, which is lovely to help with our busing. Um, but we were still worried about how much, how many cars would be and whether we were allocating enough time. It went very well. Couple little hiccups in the schedule. Um, not to belabor the point, but I do have to also give kudos to some of our kids. We had students, I even had a fourth grader who had never been in our building who came on Monday with a smile on her face, walked up to me because I was greeting in the hall and said like, hi, it's my first day, I don't know where to go. I was like, okay, we'll help you, no worries. I had other learn at home students returning to us, either having never been with us or only been with us since fall, you know, not since fall, um, coming in and immediately other students saying, oh, where are they trying to get to, Mrs. Hilliard? I'll take them, I'll bring them to class, no worries. Um, it was one of those moments that just that sort of pride in our student population in our school. Um, so I was smiling actually a lot more than I expected and our barriers were um, very small and we've started to work on them. Um, and, and I truly believe that by the end of this week, those tiny little problems with the schedule will be completely resolved. Great. Questions for, for Sean? I have a question that I wish I had thought of on the um, the April 8th meeting. Um, just with the way you set up the uh, the learn at home cohort and the, um, I was wondering what provisions do you guys have put in place for students who have to quarantine? So full, like in-person students who are out quarantining, um, how are they accessing so we, we've had actually three re different responses to um, that exact situation. If it's in our middle school, in seventh and eighth, we can easily allow them to access um, as a learn at home student. It's really easy to sort of migrate them in and out because it's the same four teachers. And it is, I can set aside, even now there's a block set aside in our schedule for those students. So I can 
kind of rotate someone in and out as that need arises. Sixth grade, we have six teachers who teach in partners in, in two pods, and only one of those pods has a learn at home component. So it becomes a little more difficult and we don't have that option in fourth and fifth at all um, within our own building, our own teaching staff. So what we did in response to that, knowing that that could be an issue, and this was with help, um, particularly with Natasha and Jackie, is we have one of our teachers who took a leave of absence this year. So she's a certified teacher, a certified special educator that we then put in touch with those students and families who have to be on that quarantine so that she is actually available to do some of that online teaching, that support. And they all, she also coordinates with the actual classroom teachers so that communication um, is a full circle, if that makes sense. Thank so, you. If, if that happens, does the school reach out to the family of the child who's quarantined or do the parents need to initiate that? So because they have to fill out the health screening, we find out from the health screening that there's an issue. The initial contact is from the school nurse to follow up on what that issue might be. If it leads to um, that idea that they must quarantine, then we actually tell them that we're going to pass their child's name on to um, Alex Crocker Duhamel. And then we also tell the teachers, we do use the words that it's an extended absence because it could be for a reason other than quarantining and we're not looking to have anyone have information they don't need. A child could have surgery and be out for an extended absence. And because we've put this in place, we can support any student who's out on an extended absence, no matter the reason. So we tell the teachers and Alex, there's an extended absence. And then we, we begin that support. So we do actually reach out to those families with that support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to answer that as well? I know it's Sean's turn, but. Yeah, sure. So um, we have to do something slightly different. Uh, we had somebody to be able to work with our school, but unfortunately they didn't stay on with us. So we worked with the team leaders to create a protocol that we could handle within our building and within our current staff. So because all of our teachers are teaching face-to-face -face all the time, they didn't have time in their day to always connect with all of the students the way that they would if it was remote learning. So what, they, what happens now, very similar to what Sean said, is that anybody who's going to be absent for, for two or more days is considered on an extended absence. No one knows why, um, but because, because we wanna keep their confidentiality. Um, and then what happens is, is that Nicole Mela, our re receptionist, sends an email to the, the parent it's a form letter from me that basically says that we're going to notify the teachers and the special ed department. We all, it's just part of our protocol just to make sure um, that this student is on an extended absence and a teacher, the classroom teacher will reach out to them within the next 24 hours and that the parent is welcome to share whatever they're comfortable sharing, but they do not have to share the reason for the extended absence. And then the, then I list the things that the, the parent can expect can happen during an extended absence. So we currently use Seesaw, and so the activities are posted on Seesaw. Teachers provide daily feedback to those activities, and that there's some communication with the student and the teacher every 24 hours. That can look different depending on what grade level, depending on what activities are going on. Um, some teachers have been able to very cleverly zoom in with the student during um, a group task so that the student doesn't miss out on that opportunity. So actually I was in a classroom recently where a student was um, at home and they were working in a group with another student um, because they didn't want to miss out on their group project. Um, it was a nice animal habitat project. Um, and so they, they were able to keep the learning going forward. Some activities don't lend themselves that well um, to that. And by the way, we can actually do the same thing I just mentioned in reverse. So if a teacher is on extended absence, we can almost do the same thing where the teacher zooms into the classroom and is able to uh, provide some instruction at times. So we've been pretty clever uh, with how to make it work. Um, and I will say that the parents have been very flexible and understanding and working with the teachers 
to give them more information than what we would be able to share with them, but that helped customize their learning while they were on a next absence. Excellent. Uh, do we have any other questions for, for Sean, Jess? Okay, Jackie. Um, so my board report, the board report focuses on the survey that went out to parents and it, you know, it's, it's funny, it's a little outdated now as, uh, you know, cause now we're fully back. Um, but what we are doing is digging into it. Um, I've provided you with the a family survey for each of the schools on the, you know, the high level topics. And so as a team, we're digging into lessons learned, you know, things we want to make sure we capture um, to move forward into next year, things that we want to rethink, even finishing out the rest of this year. Um, but wanted to share out, um, you know, overall, I think there's a lot to feel really good about. Um, and then there's some things to work on, some of which got addressed by on Monday when everyone came back. Questions for Jackie? Do we have a Natasha report? I didn't see it. We combined forces. Gotcha. Yes. Good. All right. Okay. So now we have the manifest, which has gone around, I believe, and the reconciliation report. Chris. All right, so uh, first I'm going to go over the regular reconciliation, and then um, we ha we're looking to have a little discussion around um, the bottom line and some of our projects. So um, to start off with the, the regular general fund reconciliation that we have, um, we did make an enhancement on the revenues or the, um, yeah, the revenues up top. Um, so in the past, we've had, you know, five to 10 different subject um, categories of other local. And I felt like that was kind of confusing. So what I did was I bunched, uh, I put the amount that, that, the, that we proposed to the DRA in revenue for other local on one line. And then we broke it down as a subset. So as you can see, we had other local, we budgeted $8,000 with the DRA. We've gotten prior year refund, unclaimed property, E-rate, current year refunds, and, have, and the health trust surplus this year. All of those add up to the 93,000 that you see following the 8,000. And so, so far we've gotten $85,000 in excess of our original budget on that line. So I think that looks a lot cleaner than the the, fav the difference favorable, unfavorable column being all over the place. Um, so we did that. And then on the expenditure side, the only line that we've currently overspent is student support services. Um, and right now that that has to do with some additional uh, speech expenses that we that we've had in the district. Uh, Okay, so that's the reconciliation. Oh, actually, I gotta say the bottom line. Uh, so the bottom line is $574,116.07. When we compare that to this time last year, uh, this time last year we had 2.64% of the budget on the bottom line. Uh, and so this year we have 3.66% on the bottom line. So we are at a higher position than we were last year at this time. And so that leads into the second discussion that I had spoken about. Can everybody see the anticipated return to taxpayers? Yep. Okay. Um, and so with the, uh, we just touched that there's $85,000 in other local that we had not anticipated. Um, and then there's some additional revenues in the other revenue lines that are going to be a favorable. 
Um, but there are also some lines in the, in the revenues that we know will be a disfavorable. Um, interest is going to be much lower than we had anticipated. Uh, the tuition is not going to come in because we didn't end up running preschool. And Medicaid is not coming in as anticipated as well. So those are those are estimates that we did adjust during this budget process. Um, and we're going to make sure that those those are at lower numbers so that we don't have those deficits in the, in the next year. And then the bottom line, there's also a good amount of healthy budget general fund balance on the expenditure side. Um, so we feel that we could definitely have a bottom line commitment of at least $300,000. And so the discussion that we wanted to have was looking at proposal for summer projects. And so the summer projects that, that Jackie and I and administration from the buildings have discussed, um, and this is listed by priority, are wireless access points, a server for the, w, the Ware Middle School camera system, cleaning the ducts of the buildings, paving is, is sorely needed at Center Woods. Um, that we're working on quotes specifically on that. Um, we've, we've gotten quotes done in, in the last five years or so on the, the circle of where the buses drop off and then um, another part of the staff parking lot. Uh, and so that, I think those, just those two parts were in the 20 to 30 range, uh, 20 to $30,000 range. Um, and so the 100,000 would be potentially the entire but it could go higher or lower where, we're, like I said, we'll get quotes on that. Um, and then where middle school is in, in pretty good need of a multi-seasonal tractor, um, mainly for usage during the winter time for, for the areas that they need to clean off that, that Firmly Rooted does not address, um, but they could also utilize it, the right solution in the summer um, for the ball fields and, and moving uh, moving stuff for the ball fields and things of that nature. Um, so we wanted to have this discussion before we did any kind of purchasing with regards to these projects um, to gauge the, the board's interest. So, so question, go ahead. I was gonna, so you're saying that in lieu of returning to the taxpayers or in addition to so the, these summer projects be in addition to returning to the taxpayers also? So we, not in lieu of the 300,000, we were looking to commit the 300,000 and engage the board's interest in using additional funds that are on the bottom line currently gotcha. to address these needs. Okay. And then, and one, I'm sorry. Sorry, and, and one thing I didn't say is that the wireless access points are actually items that we removed during the budget process um, because we had discussions that the bottom line was healthy. Because I'm actually, you said you listed it there in order of, um, necessity or priority because I'm kind of looking at cleaning the ducts the ducts especially right now would be more of a priority even though the other things are important um, mm -hmm. than a camera system server and I know you know the money is not even comparable but also if you ever had to pick up your child on an icy day at CWS you know how bad that parking lot is because where you have to come to a stop in the old days to pick up the kids and then this year where you take the turn to go around it's a total ice skating rink there um, so yeah. I would really like to say maybe discussion about reprioritizing that list if possible. Yeah, um, I think on the safety rather than um, the only I reason know. just to address that the only, the only reason I put the access points up top was just because the the technology is going end of life and so we in the next year we have to replace it. So if we don't do it this year, we'll have to do it next year. Um, but honestly, I think everything in the list has a pretty high priority to what we need. I'd agree on that. Yeah, especially since so much of, of teaching is sort of tech related, we gotta have, we have to have access in the building, right? That's a, that's a must have. Now is the camera system, is that the one to broadcast our, our meetings? No, no it's security. security camera. Security camera. Okay, that's clearly important given a uh, history of things that have happened, say, on the skateboard park. Um, and ducks, 
I, I echo Christine's point. That's critical. If we want to come back in the fall and we want to make sure that everything's as healthy as possible. I know there's some interest in the community of talking about when, when the masks go away and stuff. And when that happens, we got to make sure we have, have clean air. So that's critical. And paving, uh, yep, been there. Chris, right, Jack. I, don't, I don't know if it's, if you're ready. Um, so part of this conversation, as we were listing like all the needs, a lot of the needs understandably focused around center woods. And we actually, uh, uh, we have some bids or a list of things that need to be addressed at center woods. As we looked at that, what became evident is, I, I think, a priority for the board over the next few months will be to determine a direction for center woods. Do we invest in these things? So, so some aspects of center woods are grandfathered. There's not a sprinkler system. And should we engage in some of you know substantial work? We have to put that sprinkler system into the tune of uh, nine hundred thousand dollars. It's the top right. top item on the screen. And so you know, do we? We, we just have to make a decision about what we're going to do with center woods. Um, and, and so we took anything that was infrastructure or, or renovation out of what we're proposing to you. Not that these aren't really important um, because I, we felt that discussion you know, at the facilities committee and then brought back to the board needed to happen and a plan had to be in place. And then we could systematically work through these projects um, if, if that's the direction you want to go. But there's yeah. substantial work. And we do have uh, the, the funds. Um, we, we, we got one-time funds last year that we have in an account to address some of these needs. Um, but it would allow us to, again, create a plan on how we're going to address the issues that are there. So what Chris just proposed are don't fit into those categories purposefully. So I'm guessing what you're um, hinting at is do we spend three and a half million to fix up center woods or do we rebuild? And I don't, I mean, I don't have a, that, that would be the will of the community, Sure. And, uh, but it's a discussion that has to be had. Certainly. If we're talking about three and a half million just to, Catch the building versus new. That's a discussion we will have to have. And yeah. and just to say it, the that conversation circles back around to the the, the kindergarten conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Do we have room for additions on Center Woods? Yes, you do. But if we do an addition, do we have to put in the sprinkler system? Yes. Yes. And my question about the sprinkler system too. Um, I don't know. I've been in the building many times, but I haven't looked at this particularly. Do you have connecting rooms that have a connecting door between them? Because I know legally they can't have locks on them if there aren't sprinklers in the rooms. So if there was a sprinkler system, would that allow those connecting doors to have a lock? Because I know like with lockdowns, it's very difficult when you're in a classroom that has a connecting door, you have to depend upon the other classrooms being locked so that your classroom is safe. So would a sprinkler system allow for that to happen? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Any questions for Chris? I had a question about above um, the the camera system and the wireless access points, have they looked into any grants for that, especially anything to do with security? There's usually quite a bit out there for that. Um, so I, if we do move forward, I would anticipate that we look at E-rate. That's, that's, that's an option that we've frequently looked at. Um, I, can, I can have a discussion with uh, Chris Auger, the, the lead technology person, to see if that has been anything else that he's seen come through, but we'll, we'll definitely make sure that we check that box. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? 
Okay, Chris, for you, do you need a, a motion or is this just an FYI at this point? I think we would we would be looking for some guidance on the board on what on what if if the if the numbers that are on the screen are, are what you are all comfortable with. Um, if you would want to edit any of them, um, I do want to say out loud that the the numbers that I have approximately do not add up to the four hundred thousand. That's just to leave room for quotes coming in and and to manage the process for these these specific five items. So I think where the action um, could come is the board committing to a bottom line that we're going to uh, return to taxpayers. So whether that's 300,000 and then the board authorizing us to move forward um, with projects, it, our intention are these projects um, it, up to $400,000. Um, or edit that if you if you want to. Um, I have a question on where this money is coming from because I see like the top one was removed from the budget. Are you trying to take that out of the money that's supposed to go back to the taxpayers? We removed, we went back in November and December and January when we were going through the budget process we removed the access points from our proposal for next year. So now we're going into this knowing we got additional revenues that we weren't anticipating and we have surplus, um, we have money we didn't spend in other budget lines. So your bottom line is, is very healthy right now. Um, what, districts have done in the past is take your job as the board is to manage the bottom line and to decide how much you want to commit to give back to the taxpayers and how much you want to use on things that need to be done around the, the district. Okay. Can you go back down to the the bottom page too? Yeah, I, I wasn't finished reading this. Thank you. And the the header of this one gets cut off, um, but the proposal for future years on on these items here, if we were to move forward with with PCA, doing the Central Woods building and, and improving it moving forward, we would be looking at. For, for some of these ventilation items, we would be looking at COVID funding and as well as the trust, uh, the capital reserve funds that we put the one-time adequacy funding in this prior year, which is approximately, in, it's in excess of $700,000. So can we use the um, COVID funding to do the duct if that was the will of the board, we could do that, yes. Because I do really think that's a priority in, um, and if we can use that money, I think that would be the best route. Well, couldn't we use it for the wireless access points also because of needing to have that, uh, the access for learn at home kids if, if teachers are teaching remotely from inside the school? So could that go under the COVID money also? Uh, you know what, I think almost all of this could go under, um, maybe not the, the tractor uh, <laughs> and the, the paving, but the other things could go under the ESSER funding. It's, as a board, are you looking to return $500,000, $300,000, um, and would you like to use some of the money that's on the bottom line to do some of these projects? Because we can still manage though the ESSER funds. We have those for the next couple of years. We obviously don't have budget, this, this budget funding beyond June 30. What's the total amount that we can give back? Um, well, you know, at this point in the year, 
the reconciliation. What was that number, Chris? Uh, 574 uh, is on the expenditure bottom line. Right. And, you know, we're going to spend some money between now and the end of the year. Um, but what Chris detailed is that we have additional revenue and um, you know, we have some open positions that we didn't uh, hire for and we have you know, other places in the, the budget, some things we spent, we use grant money for, we use the supplemental funding for um, that took it out of our budget here and so that's part of what makes the, the um, bottom line so high. So um, I guess I'll just make a motion to give the taxpayers their money back and then use the CARES funding for this stuff. Um, so to not spend any money on any of the projects, um, would be the motion, I think, to, uh, to, to just use the CARES funding for, um, for what we need done. And so to not do the paving and to not do the tractor. Um, I think the paving maybe should just be on hold until we figure out what we're even going to do with the school. If we're going to completely redo the school or if we're going to just upgrade what needs done. I think maybe that should go together to, you know, we don't want to redo the, the um, paving and then have them, you know, demolish the school, rebuild it and have all those tractors and everything driving all over them. Jackie, if we were talking about putting an addition on the school or anything like that, that would take a while to get to, wouldn't it? Yes. And I, I feel that paving, like I said, if you dropped off a kid when there's any kind of ice, um, that is actually, it's when you take that turn and go down, it's a sheet of ice. And for buses, for um, cars to go down, I think that's more of an immediate need. And paving does need to be taken care of every chunk of years. Okay, so so sorry, just point of point of order. So there's a motion. Is there a second? Then we can have a discussion. So your motion is to give all of the excess money back to the taxpayers. A second. Okay. Now we have discussion. So go ahead, Kristen. Sorry, I I just feel that the um I know that the tractor I believe it has to do with plowing and they did lose their um snowblower this year. So would the tractor be helping out with that? We've been using um, residential snow blowers, um, and it's there. It's just not adequate. Yeah, just and it's it, it not. And it, it's they did a fantastic job, but I would see them out there very early and really trying to push it with those to be able to get in by the time the teachers had to cross the the parking lot. I feel that. All those summer products uh, projects that you have there are all important. I think it's important to return some money, um, but I also think that none of these are superfluous. They all look like there's something that needs to be done. Um, just a comment on you said the paving, Christine was, or so the paving is one issue, but you said there was ice buildup. That seems like maybe a drainage issue that maybe needs to be assessed or a runoff, maybe water runoff from the building. The paving might not necessarily fix that if it's not addressed around that area. Yeah, I agree. And, but it's also what you'll see cracks in the pavement and the pavement has started to, to go in certain directions. So yes, it probably does have a drainage, but there would have to be the, pa the, the pavement, but also even just going to the circle. Um, I don't think we're looking for aesthetics here. I think we're looking for safety. And I'm not a paver. I just know that I've, I've driven it. Um, I think that we're fortunate right now to have, um, to have such a, a good bottom line. And this seems like a great compromise to me between um, respecting 
taxpayers um, and in returning some of that money, but also using this wonderful situation we're in to be able to accomplish some of the projects that really need to get done um, in a year that we can get it done so that we don't have to ask for that money um, later. Um, I think having it now, as opposed to having to being forced to put those things in a budget, maybe next year when things might be a little tighter for people, um, it's like that stuff is, has to happen. Um, so if we can get it done in a year where um, we can still give money back to the taxpayers and accomplish these important projects, um, I think is a would be a good move. Yeah, I agree. And I, I'm concerned about just um, saying, let's spend all the, the, um, the COVID money, all the, the ESSER funds without hearing from the administration on what their priorities are. So we see a big bucket of money and we say, okay, let's just use that all here. But I don't know that there's more important things like the, the social emotional learning um, counselors that we talked about in our last meeting. Um, there's a lot of more direct, there may be, I don't know, there may be more direct COVID funded projects that are a higher priority than cleaning the deck works or paving. I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm worried about just jumping onto that money because we heard it. Any other thoughts? Um, I just, you know, think if people are freaking out that they're going to catch COVID from air, then having clean air is probably a priority. And um, uh, like Sarah said about, um, we have the money now, so why not use it instead of asking for it later? But that's kind of the entire point of a budget is to show them we're going to do this, this, and this with your money and then you vote on it, yes or no, is that okay? And, um, you know, just saying like, oh, well, we have your money now, so we're going to do what we choose with it. I just don't really see that as being transparent or okay, because it's not things that they voted on. You know, we had it in the budget for the access points, and then we removed it, and now we're just going to spend the money anyways after we didn't put it in the budget to, you know, get their permission. I, so that's, that's where I'm at with it is like just because we have the excess money doesn't mean that we should just use it because that's the entire point of the budget is to get their permission on what we're spending their money on. Um, may I speak to that? I Please. definitely like I respect that position um, and you know we try to be very careful about that. Um, I, I think the voters vote on the lines in the budget, not specific items. Um, and, and so we're not looking, none of the things that are being proposed are from lines that we didn't put forward. Um, and, and so we're building budgets 18 months ahead of time. And you know, clear, obviously this year, there was no way of predicting the things that have come up. And, and so, this bottom line is a is a really small percentage of the whole budget and we've managed that budget responsibly and this is where we're at um and it is fairly standard for a board to decide to do especially projects like this at the end of the year but rochelle i i do understand your point yeah and i would say uh, go ahead the ducks isn't like something that just randomly came up because of COVID. It's been something that's being been being neglected. And I've been, um, you know, like trying to push for it. And I tried to push for it to go into the budget because that is important and it is a priority. And um, that got, you know, voted down or, you know, we didn't want to vote on it. I forget now, but um, it's not like it's just randomly come up. It's something that should be done you know, every few years and it's just been completely neglected. Oh, well, with respect though, I mean, the, the budget is ongoing money, right? So once you put it in that budget is year by year by year, right? So when you add $120,000 to our bottom line, it will get voted down in this town, 100%, right? So we've been trying to be creative of how we can handle this. It sounds like it right 
now we actually have the surplus so that we can tackle it. I do think in the same way it's this and technology, right? We need to figure out how we get ongoing funds into the budget, but that's a separate discussion uh, than we need to clean the ducks. That's a one-time cost at this point. Then the long-term yeah. cost is how we fund it moving forward. Right. And that's what I was suggesting is that we, um, you know, Chris and I had talked during the facilities meeting about um, doing it in sections and then rotating every year. You know, we divide it by how many sections there are and we put that much into the budget because it costs that much to do that one section every year so that yearly it's all being rotated and being done. And this definitely needs to be paid for and done one way or another. I just think if we have the CARES funding and it will cover it, that should be the that should be the number one priority. Because it's not COVID aside, dirty ducks is super unhealthy and dangerous. Yeah, of course. I think we we violently agree on that. So what we're talking about now is how we're gonna fund it. And your motion is that we use the CARES funding for that. Yes. Okay. Any other comments? To clarify, I'm sorry, the motion was not to um, use end of year funds for these projects. That is the motion, you're right. Thank you for the clarification. Right, so I'm concerned that in a later discussion, if we, if we were to vote on that motion, that in a later discussion that could these important projects could get put on a back burner or that we could decide to use the CARES funding for something else. And that thing that we all agree is super important would not, would again, not get done. Um, so that's. To be clear, my motion was to give them the taxpayer back their money and, and use the CARES fund for what we can in this list. That's how I understood it. We might need a clarification on what we can. Okay. Um, all right, so are we ready to vote? Rochelle? Yes. Christine? No. Daniel? Yes. Sarah? No. Wendy, no. So that does okay, not pay. We give them their money. So do when, we have, could I make a motion to please. return um, $300,000 to the taxpayers and then fund the summer product projects that um, we have here on the spreadsheet? Okay, do we have a second? I I'll second. second. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, read me, go ahead. Okay, I second do, that. Do we have any more discussion? So we're going to pay with the taxpayer's money what we could use the CARES funds for. Is that right? I the think we're agreeing to refund the taxpayers um, a sizable portion of money while agreeing to use excess funds that have already been budgeted for, for important projects which allows us to use the CARES fund for other valuable things going on, on in school that aren't necessarily um, these sort of facilities projects because there's other um, curriculum pieces and social emotional pieces and um, personnel things that need to be addressed as well with the CARES Act. So that's my thought on it. Because Jackie just said it was a very small portion of the budget being sent back, so. <laughs> um, as a percentage, we're talking, you know, it's a $16 million budget. Right. And so, um, you know, the, the fact that we've managed the budget to uh, $500,000 is a ton of money, and I'm not taking away from that, but it is... Um, it, 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 we, we, you manage a budget for 18 months out to get to this point and uh, you're not going to get it exact. I think the taxpayers, when we voted, we, we voted to agree 
I mean, we voted to approve that amount of money. So, so returning um, even a portion of it is, is a win-win situation. It's not like we're asking for more money in addition to the budget that's already been approved in order to do funds that are important for their health um, and safety of our children. I believe the taxpayers could also decide what is beneficial for the safety of our children as well. Um, my, my point being is that if we have money that's available and we want to use it, the taxpayers probably should vote on that individual, on those individual items, especially ones that cost this amount of money. And if we have the COVID or funds, if you want to put it that way, uh, it, it really, it came down to everything basically on this list qualified for honestly the first two the wireless points and the camera system qualified qualifies for grants at some level um even if it was covered under the COVID and nobody wanted to pursue that the the duct i would assume that we all agreed all right. that probably is covered under there so we have paving which was a possibly may may or may not be money you know ill spent if there's construction issues and things like that coming in the future with, you know, three point something million dollars to be possibly spent on that building or possibly voted on a different building. And then a tractor, you know, obviously wouldn't be covered. So really we were looking at those two line items, paving and the tractor from what I gathered in all this discussion. And so, um, uh, you know, if if it comes down to voting for those things um, with all the parents that bring their kids to school and a tractor, um, I I don't believe I believe that honestly those things should go to be voted on by the taxpayers. It is a sizable chunk of money if it can't be covered under the COVID fund. I, um, I think though that that's why we are on the school board, right? Like the, the taxpayers elected us to make these decisions on behalf of them when, when they come up. Um, and, and so um, I think that's our function, right? Because there's always gonna be situations where, as Jackie said, we, the budget isn't going to be exactly what we expected it to be. There needs to be some wiggle room. So our purpose is, um, one of our purposes is to, to approve what we what we do with that. Any other comments? Okay, the motion to send back three hundred dollars in surplus funds to the town and propose this. Approved. You said three hundred, three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. And <laughs> approve uh, these five projects um, for with funds up to four hundred thousand dollars. Obviously, that's not all coming from the bottom line because that doesn't that math doesn't work right. So, assuming some of that money is coming from COVID funding and or grants, um, that is the motion, uh, Christine. Yes. Uh, Rochelle. No. Sarah. Yes. Daniel. No. Wendy. Yes. The motion passes. Okay. Our next topic is personnel. Sean, do you want to talk about your nominations? Certainly. Sorry, I was uh, getting to those buttons. Um, so I'm very excited to bring three very strong candidates forward um, to the school board. And so um, we do still have a couple open positions, but we did have a number of wonderful applicants for a number of our positions. The first one I'll talk about just briefly, and you have the nomination form, is Bill. Um, it is William, but he goes by Bill. We're excited to bring on someone who I think one of the things beyond all the qualifications you see on the nomination form is he really talked about um, this being a second career for him, but looking for um, making a home. And, and really coming and finding a community where it could be his home and where he sort of came to the second career and, and just stayed someplace. And, and I think the board members and many 
probably community members too who are listening on know that that's been one of our goals the last few years is really to retain folks, to bring people into this team and to build those skills and to really build a strong team. So when he began to speak to that along with his qualifications, along with having a unique background that we think really brings a unique perspective for our eighth grade students, and lastly, that his references were just wonderful when we spoke with folks um, about him and about the qualifications and his demeanor that he would bring into the classroom. We were very excited. Um, I'll go through all three and then you can ask. Okay, thank you. Um, so our other very exciting, uh, I've never encountered so many strong candidates in one pool for one of our teaching positions. Um, both for our ELA position I just spoke about with Bill and for this science position, our interview committee had to have a whole separate meeting because we were so struggling having more than one really strong candidate. That's a great problem to have. With our seventh grade, uh, excuse me, our middle school science position, um, we again had amazing candidates and really what put Chloe a little bit above and beyond is she's sort of already part of our community. Um, she's someone that folks know, um, have a history with even as a student. And although that's not what we would base a selection on, it did make us really understand where her heart is and how her heart has always been in improving others in working with other students, even as a peer. So we were very excited. She again um, interviewed incredibly well and has such amazingly strong references. So we're very excited to bring Chloe on board. Last but not least in this um, round is Liz. So if you saw the professional nomination form, you'd see that we didn't interview a lot for this position. We didn't have a lot of applicants, but what was so exciting is this is an applicant who knows two people who are currently working in our school who came from another location. She also came from that location. And so um, we, I, I could almost feel guilty that I feel like I keep taking the best of their um, educators, but I don't really because it's going to benefit our students. Um, again, had amazingly wonderful qualifications and recommendations um, from outside of our school, but also the two staff members within our school who have worked prior um, years with Liz. And when you notice her qualifications, she has a number of certifications. So having that depth of knowledge and that multiple perspective, we think will bring a great deal of benefit to our school. Do we have questions for Sean? Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept these nominations? I'll make a motion to accept the nominations. Okay, Christine. do I have a second? I'll second that. Sarah second it. Okay, any more discussion? I think it's great that you found so many qualified candidates at this point. I'm sure going into the summer, it'll be a little bit more relaxed. Yes, as a board realized that the, these are folks that we knew because of retirements and things like that. So we were able, um, and I learned a couple years ago that I really need to see that hiring is probably one of the most important things I do as a job as part of my job. And so we really prioritize this as an admin team. And um, we're very fortunate to be able to get these terrific people on at this point. Okay, so roll call vote, accept these nominations. Christine? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Daniel? Yeah. Sarah? Yes. And Wendy? Yes. All right, we have, do we have a motion to accept the resignation? Linda Hanley. I'll make a motion to accept the resignation. Okay, so okay. thank you, Sarah. Do I have a second? I'll second with regrets. Okay. We assume there's no discussion. Okay, so roll call vote to accept the resignation. Christine? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Daniel? Yes. And Wendy? Yes. Next two personnel issues will be in non public. Now we're up to policies. So as you may recall, um, on your first meeting, we had a couple policies. Typically you can have one or two readings. We typically do one, but since you all were so new and um, not everyone had the email access yet, we, we voted on a second reading. 
So the first one is ADC. Um, that's the tobacco ban. We, in the past, we had two policies, GBED and GICG. One was for students, one was for teachers. But if you looked at them, they were the same copy. So what we've done is moved it up into uh, ADC, which is the universal place for these policies. It also brings something, um, it updates us talking about vaping and electric cigarettes and all those kind of things that didn't exist when those old policies were written. Um, so do I have a motion to um, accept um, the amended, uh, the new policy ADC? I'll make a motion to accept. Thank you, Rochelle. Do I have a second? I'll second, Christine. Thank you. Okay, any discussion? Okay, so um, a roll call vote to adopt policy ADC, Christine? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Rochelle? Yes. Daniel? Yes. And Wendy, yes. Um, since we accepted that, let's move on to the, the deleting policies, JBED and CIJCJ. Those are the ones that are now replaced with ADC. So can I get a motion to delete those two policies? I'll make that motion. Thank you. That was Rochelle. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, so roll call vote to delete those policies. Rochelle? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Christine? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And Wendy? Yes. Okay. The other second reading, I believe, is DAF. That is um, a state mandated policy that we have to have if we want to accept federal grants. It's a new policy and it follows the model policy. Um, do we have a, a motion to accept DAF? I'll make that motion. Thank you. And I'll second, um, Christine. Christine, second. Do we have any discussion? Okay, roll call vote to accept DAF. Christine? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Yeah. And Wendy, yes. Okay. Um, the other new adopt policy is uh, GDC. And basically what that says, it's an optional policy, but basically what it says is teachers can't get paid to tutor their students. Um, and the, the, the belief in that policy is they're already being paid to teach their students, right? So, um, um, and the, there's a, if you actually look at the policy, let me see. I'm having trouble finding this one in my drive. Okay. Wow. Where's school district? Go back. Oh yeah, G C R D. It's ten C under the um under the April, right. like under today's. Correct, it's a pretty short policy. It says no teacher may receive pay for tutoring one of his or her pupils. The teacher should also avoid tutoring a student from his or her building. All questions regarding tutoring should be referred to the teacher's building principal. The above does not apply to school programs assigned by the school administration. So does this mean they can't tutor after school for pay either? Correct. Is this like um, mandated from the state or is it not? No, it's a, uh, um, it is a conflict of interest to tutor your own students for pay. Hmm. Um, so I, I just have a, a question, I guess, that expands upon Rochelle's. So um, like, I know we offer uh, academic support on Thursdays um, after school, which is beyond contracted hours. Um, and so, and, and teachers get paid like the hourly rate to do that. Would this prevent that from happening? Because that's a school program. Um, the conflict comes with, um, you know, if I'm having trouble in chemistry and, mm -hmm. and then I have to pay my teacher to, to Ooh, chemistry, gotcha. you know, that, that, that isn't right. Um, right. Okay. We have 
music teachers who work at other organizations and kids go there, you know, to strings and things and they go and take lessons there. That's different from, okay. you know, I'm, I'm hanging up my shingle uh, um, to help you like in my class. We set up programs that support students and, and teachers get stipends through us for that, um, different than the like private fields. And this isn't something that's unlike in other districts. Other districts do the same thing. You can, you can tutor other teachers' students, just not your own. So this isn't um, just to, to wear. So like a seventh grader could get tutored from an eighth grade teacher, just not if they're in the actual same class. I, I would caution that that is a bad idea um, within the same school, but um, it would not be a... According to this policy, it would not violate the policy. Okay. Because I'm just thinking back, like, my when I was in school, my parents paid my teacher for after school tutoring, and it made it, like, really good because they knew what we were working on and what I needed help with. <laughs> Is there a current conflict with this uh, type of issue or is it just preventative? Um, they're not in this district, no. So what, what supports um, are offered at the elementary school and middle school level that would be in lieu of a student getting tutored from their teacher? We actually um, have tutoring, and I can let Sean talk to, uh, to this a little bit more, but we have tutoring that happens um, and students who stay after um, can get you know, specific support. They work with actually the Boys and Girls Club to coordinate some of that. Um, and you know, that, that, that's been ongoing for a few years now. Sean, do you have anything to add to that? The only thing that I would add is when we go um, we're in a more typical year. And when we return to a more typical year, we also offer what we call a flex um, section. And we actually have software that helps. So a math teacher actually during the school day signs up the students who they know are struggling to meet with them. So it is the same teacher, but it does happen within the school day. And the reverse can also happen. The student can actually also ask for that additional support. So we have a couple of ways. And as Jackie said, we also have after school, but those groups are put together um, by skills and by criteria that the student has shown that they need that. So the RTI process, um, so that has been ongoing and has not been quite as robust this year, but again, we've had to work around a couple other um, barriers that were put in place this year. So you said the students can request it. So I'm assuming um, the parents can also call in and request it the same? Flex support? I'll, yeah. I'll speak yeah. to that a little bit. During the flex time during the day, then certainly we uh, would welcome parents putting in or asking um, about what supports are available to their students. The Title I after school programming, they do have to meet a criteria to be part of that program. Um, and that is federally mandated that in order to be, um, to receive Title I services, you have to meet a certain level of criteria. Okay, so um, did I have a motion to approve? Um, GDC. Also move. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Any more discussion? I'm just like trying to figure out what the harm is if a parent wants to hire a teacher to tutor their kids. And I'm not like trying to be difficult. I'm just trying to really figure out why. Um, because there, it's a conflict of interest. I Do just don't, I don't understand why you think, like why, like why is it a conflict? Because it's just a, a parent, it's between a parent and teacher and a student. Um, I, you know, I think the idea is that we should be meeting the needs within the school day. 
or, or within the school programming? It could, I was, it, you know, and, 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 you know, somebody could have a, a side business, you know, going on with tutoring. Um, it could get out of hand. Uh, I, you know, I don't, our, our teachers don't do that, um, but it, it could get out of hand. And it, um, you're not supposed to monetarily benefit from your, your students. Um, Failure. Right. Um, if you, if they're not, <laughs> that, uh, I'm sorry. um, and so this just clarifies, I think it is, um, actually embedded in the code of conduct. Um, but this makes it explicit. So it's, I, I think it would already, even if you decided you didn't want to pass this, it would already be something that, um, isn't allowed. Um, through the state code of conduct for teachers. Right. So like, it would be strange for me to have a student who's not passing my class and then charge mom and dad $40 a week to, to help him or her one-on-one, -on -one, which yeah, feels tricky. Yeah. I also wonder if that makes it look like, um, so my kid wasn't my kid wasn't passing, so I paid you $40 and now they pass. So did you actually tutor them or did I bribe you to pass my kid? And not that that would never happen in our district, but it has that air about it, I guess. Jackie, is there someone in each of the schools that parents could call if they are interested in their child getting some extra tutoring for anything? So they will take that component of talking to the teacher, because I know um, we've been encouraged not to suggest tutoring because if we do, then it's the school district's responsibility to do. Um, but if a parent reaches out, like we have a re our reading specialist kind of takes care of the tutoring list and you can just put as a teacher, you can put yourself on that list and then the reading specialist will pair you up. Um, so there isn't a conflict of interest. Is there someone at the schools available for that? Um. Sean, can you, this is more applicable, I think, at the middle school, but Jess or Sean? Sure. So this is, um, at least in our building, what I think might answer your question is that would be part of our RTI process. So parents and or teachers can reach out um, to any of the admin um, or through their teacher, then it would come, you know, the parent to the teacher, the parent directly to admin, and then teachers to admin. And we actually, we meet weekly, we talk about difficulties, whether they're academic or behavior students are having, and then we look at the resources that we could apply to those difficulties um, to help that student. So that communication, and then we reach back out again to parents and teacher um, about where that conversation landed, what we might try. And that is why in our building, and I, I believe so in justice too, but we have um, not only our special education teachers, but we do benefit from having some interventionists. And that would be one of their roles would be to offer that small group, often small group support in both reading and math. Did that uh, and I'll just piggyback on that, Christine, having um, knowing that what list you're talking about, um, the, the 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 potential conflict or the potential um, rub is that if we have a list, it implicitly endorses the people on the list. Um, and that would be something that would be very hard for us to monitor um, as to the quality of, of the tutoring services provided. Um, so, I mean, I do think there are resources out there for parents to seek tutors uh, to private hire tutors, um, but I want us to be careful about not getting in the business of endorsing tutors. Could, um, could we maybe alter the language of this to be more clear to say like, no teacher may receive pay for privately tutoring or for, for providing non-school funding tutoring, like non-school funded tutoring rather? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see, let's work on that. Because I do feel like the way it's worded, it might appear that teachers won't tutor at all, but it's just that parents won't be paying us. It, it, they could, I would certainly tutor my students, but that would be a school directed thing and not come from parents' pockets. Correct. And we hire Title I tutors from within our district, and it's possible that that tutor is also the person, the student's right. teacher. 
um, but we're elicit, we're instigating that based on the student's need and um, we're hiring those people. That's a school funded event. So Jackie, do we want to um, take this back to the, the, is this something we can work on here and work out that language or do you want to send this back to the policy committee for, for more wording? What do you think? Um, if, if it is as simple as, um, you know, adding in language um, that says, you know, this does not apply to, what did you say, Sarah? Um, school funded tutoring. Okay. So, so if we added to the second paragraph, this does, this, the above does not apply to school tutoring or school programs assigned by school administrators. That sounds good. My apologies. I missed that line. It's already in there. <laughs> but hey, it doesn't work hard to put the word tutoring in there. Yeah, because it makes it, because we call a title one tutor a tutor and that could be unclear. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, so we have the motion in the second. Um, so motion to accept GDC with the added term tutoring. Uh, Christine? Yes. Daniel? No. Okay, Rochelle? No. Sarah? Yes. Wendy, yes. Okay, so readopt. Um, the other one that we had last month was, uh, I think, right, was ACE. That's a second reading, yes. And that is about handicap ACE. Mm -hmm is yeah this is our second reading for ACE um all we did was we moved the procedure out because procedures go in the um the the paired ACE dash R um piece so we've been doing this for years now um the uh regulations uh how the administration administers this goes into the other document not into the policy so we pulled that out otherwise it's a, a readopt so um, do I have a motion to accept the readoption of ACE as written? I'll make that motion. Great, Sarah, thank you. Do I have a second? A second. Second, okay, any discussion? Okay, so roll call vote on ACE, Sarah. Yes. Michelle. Yes. Christine. Yes. Daniel. Yes. And Wendy, yes. Okay. This is a, I know this is a long list. We've held a lot during budget season, so we're going to have a bunch the next couple of months, so bear with me. Um, the final one is EB, which is the Joint Loss Management Committee piece. P. If we compare this to the old one, it's a readopt, but we removed the list of the um, the safety plans, right? Because it changes every year by the government. So rather than trying to manage that list in here, this says form a joint loss committee as required, um, crisis management plan as required um, by incorporating developmentally appropriate education programs, including but not limited traffic and Pedestrian safety, bus safety, fire prevention, and online emergency system. Each principal is responsible for those. And it will be on file at the SAU office in the district building. So do I have a motion to, to readopt um, EB? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Rochelle. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Sarah. Do we have any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Sarah, you're on my camera. So. Yes. <laughs> Christine? 
Yes. Michelle? Yes. Daniel? Yes. And Wendy, yes. Okay, we got through policies. <laughs> All right, all business. We have two topics now, though. The one that was on the schedule originally was the in-person school board meetings. So let's go there. Jackie, do you have an update? So the update we have, I'm actually going to turn it over to Greg. It's about the, the sound system, Okay. the video system. Okay, we have some good news for a change. Um, the estimated time of arrival of the equipment at the SAU is supposed to be May 3rd. If that occurs, we should be able to make our live street meeting for May 18th. So that's the, the catch on it. We got it. If the delivery comes in in time, we should be able to make the 18th. Okay. So that means we could do an in person at the where middle school so we're still going to have a, a mass right so we're still going to need distance so we can't do it in the library so i assume we're talking the cafeteria or the gym i think the the cafeteria probably but i'd want to work with sean about where boys and girls club is during the day and, and how we can best navigate that but it makes the most sense okay um and you know, I, I, it wouldn't be a matter of being on Zoom. Um, I know we tried to do the in-person meeting and that was hard with um, the Zoom cameras and trying to have in-person. And so the live stream aspect does allow you know, us to use Facebook Live or, or some other avenue to broadcast out. Um, the, a decision as far as how we take public comments um, I, I think that's that's a question for the board um, about how how we take do you open up to public comment right now you're able to do that um, so folks at home watching live stream um, can they call in with public comment um, you know email public comment or do you just take public comment in the room okay. All right, so I'm making a list of all the things, all the motions and things we need. So we got public comment. Um, obviously, um, masks are going to be an issue because it's in a school that currently requires masks. Um, we're going to have to spread out, so you're going to have to have a room. That's cafeteria. Um, anything else I'm missing? We got the, the sound system, just live streaming. Logistics. Okay, so first thing is public comment. Do we have a, a thoughts about how we want to handle public comment when we go back in person with live streaming? I'd like to have the option of public comment in person, but also um, if they're at home, because there could be a variety of reasons why people are at home and I'd still like them to be able to um, say something if needed. Or I wanted. think the, um, the call-in was a good idea. Call-in. Is that something you can facilitate, um, Greg and Jackie? We can okay. work through what that will look like. Um, okay. You know, we will have a way of doing public comment um, and it may evolve as we uh, learn more about the system sure. and, and the tools and how we can interface, you know, still with a Zoom or, or not. But okay. um, there'll be a way for public comment if that's what the board wants. Yeah. Do you need a motion for that, or you just want to? You're just trying to get a polling? Because I agree. I think I, one of the things that I'm really going to be sad about missing this. Um, with this sort of Zoom world that we've been in for the last year is we've had so much more civic engagement than when we have, you know, a half a dozen people that come to our in-person meetings and it would be a shame to lose that ability. Any other thoughts on, on public comment? Okay, so my next topic was, are we comfortable with the uh, cafeteria? 
Do we have to vote on it or is that just agreed? No, it's just agreed. Just trying to work out the logistics so that we can get back in person next month. I'm comfortable. You know, one of the things I really like about the cafeteria too is you have a separate entrance. So if that becomes an issue, we can, we're not necessarily bringing people through the whole building. That's what we choose. Um, so we're comfortable with live streaming as opposed to Zoom. I mean, it's gonna have to be, right? So Jackie, we don't have to have a computer in front of us. Right. You may, but we'll, uh, at this point, Greg, do you have any thoughts on that, the public comment piece? The public comment piece, no, for the answer to your question regarding whether or not each individual board member needs a computer, the answer is if you want to have one, fine, but what we're going to be providing is two things. One is everyone's going to get a microphone, and the second thing is there will be a single camera that will be sweeping and covering everybody in the room, hence the streaming piece. Okay. Great. And I think we voted on this last time, but because it's in the school, we still have a mask requirement. We can't ask people who don't show up with a mask. So do we have accommodations for those who will not have a mask? Jackie, or obviously we will. Not obviously. I don't not know obviously? how we would do that. Okay. But we can't, we can't come back without figuring that out. Okay. Anybody have thoughts on that? Okay. Um, I have a question. So or was that, um, does that mean to be in person, to have an in-person school board meeting, everyone needs to be masked or we have to stay on Zoom? Is that- So that every, everyone who, if people have reasons why they can't wear masks, whether it's medical or something, um, we can't make them wear a mask. Um, and we can't, by law, ask them why they say they can't wear a mask. But with that said, we can't, for the people who require safety or and the school requires safety, we need a way to isolate or distance those people so that we don't put other people at risk by the people who are unable to wear a mask. So that logistical piece needs to be worked out. I know that was very vague, <laughs> sorry. Um, aren't the seats gonna be um, spaced out? Yes. Because usually it's um, a mask when you can't be, you know, six foot. Yeah, so well, I think we can. I mean, we did that last time where we were really spread out when we met in the middle school, right? My concern is if we have, I don't know how many people are gonna show up, but say we had more than we had for the deliberative session. So you had like 300 people show up. We might not be able to distance. But, but right now the school has a mask policy. So we have to figure out how we can work within that policy because we're in the school building. Which is leading into your discussion, right? Right. <laughs> <That's what laughs> All right, so we need to figure out how we're going to handle that situation um, and then we get to be in person next month which is exciting um so if you're okay with me um bringing up my stuff for the ne next sub yeah so first can... so, so let me just make sure we're done with jackie are you done with everything you needed for the in-person no <laughs> uh, okay I, mean, I i don't know how um we can set up in the cafeteria, mm -hmm. we have camera and microphone. We can live stream. We will be able to take public comment somehow. I do not know how to navigate without hiring, you know, the, the sound to have two rooms going on if that's the road we're going down. So I think we've got everything figured out up until Except the mask piece. The mask piece. Okay. Uh, and, and I don't, yeah, I don't okay. have the answer for that. Could we have an overflow room with a TV set up to watch the live stream? Yeah, I think so the that problem- if we were to go over the physical spacing? I think the problem becomes uh, at least one board member isn't going to have a mask. So um, 
she wouldn't be able to participate in the room with us. So I think we're going to have to figure out how to spread out as much as possible in the cafeteria. And you know what, if we have a meeting where we know, I mean, if we're going to have that many people, we, we right. generally have an inkling that that's going to happen and we, right. could, we could set up differently. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So we'll just set up with distancing to minimize the contact. With, okay. Right. I think in the, the cafeteria is a pretty big space. Yep. And if I may, just because of, of um, lunches, we can fit a hun 100 people in the cafe at six feet distance. Okay. So I, it would seem that would be a comfortable enough location um, for the sizes we're used to. <laughs> okay. Do we just want to plan on always being in the cafeteria for that reason? I think that's for this year, right? Who knows what next the file is going to look like? But I think that's a fair shot. And I right, that's we'll, we'll get the setup down, and I think that would be easy. <laughs> if for some reason there was a bigger meeting, we could we would go to the gymnasium. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that help, Jackie? Okay. All right. So, um, so Rochelle wanted to talk about mass in schools. And I think, I think this is a point of order. This is and totally talk everything you want to talk about. Um, I think we can't make a motion on something that wasn't on the agenda. Is that accurate? Or we shouldn't because, because we haven't noticed the public to be able to comment on it. Is that accurate or no? Is that just a. You, it is the board's prerogative. Okay. Um, I do think, um, you know, I don't know what kind of motion is coming. Okay. Or any motion, if it's just a discussion. Um, I, I we try not to have something on the agenda that wasn't posted that is significant. Um, okay. But again, that's the board's prerogative. Okay. Sounds good. All right, Rochelle, go ahead. Um. So, my point for bringing it up, obviously, is because um, you know, the governor never mandated them for school. And then he lifted it for, you know, the, the state. Um, but all of that completely aside, um, I've drove by the school many times and um, students aren't wearing masks or social distancing at recess. Um, I've had parents um, reach out to me and tell me that they've drove by at recess and the teachers aren't wearing masks or social distancing. Um, but when I drove by, the teachers were always wearing masks. Um, I have heard of full classes having their masks below their chin. Unless another adult comes in, then they put them back up. And that was instructed by their teacher. Um, I've drove by the school after school when there's sports going on and they're not wearing masks, which is amazing to see. Um, and I'm pretty sure majority of kids are back to hanging out with their friends outside of school um, because you can see them everywhere and you know parents post pictures online and um, have talked about in the various groups how you know they've gotten their kids back and they're ready to you know have their kids living like normal. Um, and then the thing that really made me want to bring this up is that a parent had let me know that she requested for her child to not wear a mask. And when we brought this up before, I would, you know, the response I got was that we would take each child and their family and their situation one by one to figure out the exemption. And when she brought this up to um, the school, they told her her accommodation is that her child could go to remote learning. And I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think that's an equal education to the students in person, especially because this child was a special needs student. Um, and the accommodations for this child are completely unacceptable. Um, so I'm sure that's happening throughout the entire school. So I think we need to look into um, 
not even just completely getting rid of the mask mandate, but making it a family and um, parents' choice on whether the students are wearing masks or not for all of these reasons. And I know we can't take a vote or whatever right now because it wasn't, you know, because I asked for it to be put on the agenda uh, too late. But um, this is something I just would like everyone to think about because it's obviously affecting one student and that's one student too many. And I'm sure there's many, many more that I just haven't been made aware of. And it's not being followed anyways. I'm just sort of processing. So I know um, there's a lot of legal things, right? So there's, we can have a non-public. Um, so if, so if a parent has asked for a waiver and they have not gotten the, their satisfaction and they've gone from the teacher to the principal to the superintendent and they're still not getting something, then a non-public meeting with us to work through that is certainly the, the next step if they've gone through Jackie. Um, it's weird because my husband works in the school and he is a germaphobe and oh my god I just said that on public um and he's not seeing what you're seeing at Center Woods so I'm wondering um and I I totally get I'm not saying that anybody's even dishonest it's just I haven't heard that um it would be I don't even know Jackie so if somebody has a concern about mask usage I assume it goes to the teacher then the principal then the superintendent and then it comes to us are you getting these complaints at this point or? I, I have not, no. Um, okay. I mean, nothing specific about a student. Um, okay. You know, my, my thought, going back to when we were doing the reopening plans, um, we had to figure out where to seek guidance. Um, and we decided, uh, and the, the plans I presented had DHHS as our guidance on public health epidemiology. I certainly do not have that expertise. Um, and, and so in the MOU we signed with, with, I believe, both the support staff and the teachers, we referenced that we're going to follow guidance from DHHS. And that has changed and evolved and we've tried to keep up with, with as it's evolved. Um, those reopening plans, I did have uh, like our lawyer look at them and you know they advised, it, it limited our liability just from like a practical perspective if we did remain consistent with uh, DHHS guidelines. Um, and it, it, it provides that fallback. So if DHHS changes their guidelines, and they are guidelines, right? It's not a legal mandate. Um, it is a local control issue. But having a reason or to make a decision that's grounded in the folks who are charged to do this is I thought how we agreed to proceed. And that's how I have been working on this. And that's what we did with the MOU. That's what we did with um, the reopening plans. So that's, I, I will, if we do something different and I don't have a reference point, I will need some help um, because now my reference point is I, I try to go to the DHHS guidelines as we make decisions. Um, so the DHHS guidelines says that, um, you know, that it's the determination of the local schools. It specifically says that each school district should um, make that decision from, for themselves and how to address students with disabilities underlying health conditions and students who um, have just don't want to wear a mask. It doesn't say to have everyone wearing a mask and the, their suggested places for them wearing a mask is um, 
entering and enter entering and leaving this school building um on the bus and uh traveling in hallways and these aren't like um requirements it specifically says recommendations and then also says traveling in the hallways um between classrooms in the bathroom and then engaged in classroom activities where the students come closer than three feet. And our students are closer than three feet um, now that we've brought everyone back at the middle school. Not everyone, but uh, we have a lot of examples. So that's exactly what I was gonna reference, the same thing. Um, yeah. And it but is- But those aren't requirements, they're recommendations. Oh, and I, I didn't say it was requirements. I've said it's, it's definitely not a legal mandate and that it, it is local control. What I'm saying is, what do you base it on if you don't base it on recommendations from DHHS? I think having a recommendation for masks um, would be the best thing. And then giving the families the option to not wear a mask. You know, you we recommend the masks. And then if they choose not to wear a mask for whatever reason, then they don't. So I do think, though, before we... And, and obviously we're not gonna decide this tonight, but I do think a very important role in this is our teachers and our staff. Um, and they have to have a say because it's not just what one family wants to do that they're impacting um, our staff, right? So, so we need buy-in. If, if we were gonna go down that route, we need buy-in from, from both unions at Midimal and the administration. Also, Wendy, I think another consideration, there's a lot of parents who sent their kids back because of the guidelines that were already in place. Mm -hmm. And so I think that needs to be taken into consideration also, mm -hmm. that parents may, families may want people best, masked around their children also. You can't control um, somebody else's body. You can't tell somebody else to wear a mask because it makes you feel safer. Rochelle, that's, that's not, not what I'm saying. Way. What I'm saying is some parents chose not to take their children it. out of learn at home based upon the guidelines that they had in place at the time. And by changing it now, you're changing what they were sending their children back to. I didn't say anything about controlling anybody else's body. You um, specifically from the said that you like that they wanted other people's kids to wear a mask around there. So that's actually exactly what you said. No, but what I'm saying is based on the guidelines that we had, that was the understanding. So they right. were understanding that other people were wearing the masks. I am right. not personally. I totally get that. So I'm, that's done. I think we have to also, um, based on conversations I've had with our school nurse um, and the, the amazing triple duty they've been doing with contact tracing, I would like to know what impact removing masks within the three feet space would have on the nurses and whether we have the timing and the staffing to be able to follow up on the, the contact tracing, which is, as I understand, mandated. Uh, well, uh, there are schools that have been open with no masks um, and no social distancing, and they have had less outbreaks and um, positive cases in their school than where has. So the masks and the social distancing isn't really doing any good. Well, we also have to compare apples to apples, right? So I don't know if that school is in the same um, type of distance as we are. It's the same size of, of, of school as ours, the same density. I, it's hard to compare. You know, Ma Manchester has a way worse situation than we have. It doesn't mean that what we're doing is that much better than them, right? Sorry, uh, Daniel, I know you were trying to talk. We're all talking, go ahead. That's okay. I was just responding to um, where the comment that was made about parents sending their children um, based off of their being mask mandates and all the social distancing. But it seems to me that it shouldn't be okay for one family to get an answer while you can just go virtual when, oh, well, those parents were on sending their kids back under the assumption that it would have to be okay for them to also be said, hey, well, you can go virtual because we've changed, you know. So that's just not a correct answer. I think what Rochelle's asking here for here is a 
a, a middle ground somewhere because we need the, the mask mandate, you know, we need to accommodate people who have exceptions without saying, well, hey, you can just go back home. And, you know, that want to have their kids in school um, because they are paying taxes for that. They do want their kids to have that in-person education. And we should be able to find ways to accommodate that, you know, as, as a school. And, you know, so you can't look at this by it's going to offend one group or it's going to offend another group because there's, there's, there has to be a happy medium here somewhere. And not everyone's going to be happy. That's just the bottom line. And I, I, to echo that point, I, you know, I think we have been trying to, to be in that, um, I don't know about happy medium, but medium. And, and I think as many people have made decisions to do learn at home because we don't have enough protections in place as folks who think we have too many. Um, and, and so we have been very definitely trying to, you know, find that, that place where, you know, we can all move forward. Um, I got as many, well, I actually got more, you know, thank you for reiterating that we will be wearing masks as I, and I got a couple um, folks who, you know, were upset that I sent that message out. But that's probably just because they know nothing's going to change. But I'd also like to add the fact that we have a child care right here in town that has never had masks for children or adults and have never had an outbreak right here and where. Um, I, I, I think this is great conversation that we're having, and I'm not sure even where I stand on one line or the other but I do want to be careful about presenting things that are anecdotal or don't have facts. Um, cause, or, or the whole picture behind that, because my children attend that daycare and where, and they did have to shut down. Um, there was an outbreak and I, um, as a parent, I am still reticent to send my child somewhere where they're not masked. And it makes me very nervous, but I have no option um, as a working as a working parent. Um, with so I, I feel like if we we just have to be really careful with this conversation that we have the whole picture and we're presenting the whole picture because I think you're right. We're all trying to find middle ground, and this is a great beginning of a discussion. Um, but. Oh no, we lost your voice. Sarah, you're muted somehow. I... No, she said she was having issues with her her vocal, and she made it through most of the meeting. I understand too where she's coming from. Maybe she can get her mic back. But um, we actually have an actual case of someone who's not been accommodated. But we don't. We, we have well. hearsay because it hasn't come before the board at this point. So if that person wants to come She's, and she skipped the board and she went straight to the state. Now it's in front of the state. Okay. And then when we get that report, then we can talk on it. I can't talk on something that somebody said something to you in the same way. You're not going to talk to something that I said, somebody said something to me without any data. So I just want to be cautious that we say there is definitely a thing. I don't have any proof of that. And I'm not saying that you're saying anything wrong. I just, I don't have anything. I have not had a report. I haven't not had a conversation. Jackie said she had not had a conversation. So, And back to the daycare, um, one adult got it. And then two months later, a child got it. It wasn't an outbreak. It was, it's been two, two months apart. So there was no outbreak. They did have and, to shut and down for four for, they had to shut down for two weeks though. So I think we have to That's be careful because when you're talking about, do. when you're talking about doing that with a school, we're not talking about six kids in a small cluster that have been isolated that you can easily close them. If, if we're talking about a school, we're talking about a much larger scale, much more contact tracing. And if you and substitute teachers, we're talking about bus 
bus transportation, we're talking, there is a much bigger impact. I think that goes back to what Wendy was saying. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not convinced either way. I'm just thinking we have to be really careful when we make this decision that it's rooted in all of the information and that we're thinking about it from all of the angles because one, one preschool classroom being shut down because a teacher had tested positive is, is much different than the amount of, of impact that would have it at the middle school or the elementary school where students are intermingling. There's more than six of them. There's, you know, like, I just think we have to be careful is all I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying to get rid of the cohorts or anything. It would be the same as it is right now with the cohorts. It would just be giving students um, a choice on what they do and don't do with their own bodies. I think that term is just challenging for me because we do have things that we have to do with their bodies, right? They have to wear clothes. They have to get certain vaccines in order to come to our school without a waiver, right? So it's not like this is a new thing. So um, if, if we want to say um, mass should be an individual cons, um, decision without regard to the larger population, that's a statement. But I think saying kids are allowed to do with what they want with their bodies is just, it's, it's a little problematic for me. It's a parental choice. I'm sorry, I can't hear you up. It's a parental choice. To wear clothes? To get vaccines, to put medical devices over their face, and yeah, to wear clothes. <laughs> and and that's that's my issue is it's a parental choice, a family choice. It's not a community choice. It's not a school choice. It's not a principal choice or a superintendent choice. This is a personal choice over something that has been proven over and over and over again that it's not doing any good. New England has the, the most strict mask laws and has the highest cases. New okay, England again, I think we need to be careful with the data. Like, I think you, like, could you, could you share your sources with, like, yes, could you send us an email with those sources? Because I just... I want to be as informed as I can be, and I seem to be getting much different information than that statement. Yeah, it just depends what news um, channel you watch, but I'll send it to you. Okay, is there anything else you wanted to talk about, Mass? I would like to also add it to the next agenda so we can actually take a vote. Mm -hmm. Does that need to be seconded or is that? Because no, I'll second no. that. So the last okay. thing we have is um, when we say um, reports, proposals for future agenda, that's where you give anything you want on the future agenda. So we'll add mass to copy our analysis. Um, and that will give parents a time, uh, the ability to come and give their input. It certainly um, will give people an opportunity to see, share some facts and, and do and their I'd own like research. To, I'd like to encourage um, parents and families to reach out on either side with your opinion so that we can know from all sides how the families are feeling. And so as you get those communications, I think just making sure that those also get shared with the board secretary um, so that we can add them to the minutes. Yeah, that would be really helpful. Then it's not, you know, Wendy's saying four people said they like masks and Rochelle's saying there's five people that don't. Like if we have those actual data, those actual letters, it helps sort of build that informal survey. Um, okay, so new business. You want to adopt the school calendar? Oh, 
I lost you. Yeah. Yes, we shared that last month and uh, there aren't any changes um, that we're proposing. So unless somebody else, you know, a board member wants a change. Okay, do you need a motion for that? Yep. Okay, do I have a motion to adopt the 2021-22 school calendar? I'll make a motion to adopt the 2021-22 school calendar. Excellent. Do I have a second? I'll second. Uh, Sarah? Mm-hmm. Okay, any discussion? Okay, so roll call vote to accept the new school calendar. Christine? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Wendy, yes. Okay, then there's a FYI about a donation for two printers from Cold Springs. Greg or Jess, you wanna to speak to that? We had, I, I was contacted by uh, Cold Springs. They indicated that they had some uh, printers that they were willing to make a donation of. Um, and the uh, tech um, at uh, Centerwoods, uh, Ken, uh, figured they would be a good fit for some of the things that he needed. So um, I picked them up and dropped them off at the school. and. Uh, uh, we'll be sending them a thank you letter for their donation, if that's okay with everyone. Sure. Is that inkjet or laser? Laser. Laser. Nice. Any questions? And because that was under five hundred dollars, we're we're just uh, sharing it with you. You don't have to vote on it. Right. All but right. The next oh. thing is the last day of school. So yeah. last year when the calendar was accepted, um, we had June 18th as the last day of school. And we are a days calendar. We count 180 school days. Uh, this year, the governor provided three work days for teachers that um, were in lieu of three student days. So that actually uh, students could go to school 177 days. There is another way to figure out um, our school year. And it, it, we have done it in, we did it last year because of um, the shutdown, um, but we can count instructional minutes. Um, and, and so going back to, I, I think one of the comments at the first public comment, we actually have more instructional minutes because of how we had to rearrange things this year. And if we counted instructional minutes, we could have June 18th be the last student day, even though we've had two school days. I mean, two snow, snow days. days. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I wanted to have that be, you know, a vote from the board that you were in favor of that. We could also just continue with our regular calendar and the last student day would be June 22nd. Um, but I think folks are eager to know what that last day is. I mean, that's assuming we don't have, um, you know, one year we had the Mother's Day floods and, and there were, it, it got extended beyond that, but I'm, and I did hear there's snow this week, but I think it's unlikely. I, I, I think we're fairly safe at this point. Okay, so because of the snow days that we took instead of remote days, we're looking at the 22nd. Um, if because of the instructional hours we had because we were remote on several days and because of the reconfiguration and because of the limited trade times because of COVID, this is one of the rare years that Ware can actually benefit from hours. And just for the newer people on the board, typically because of our Ware day, we can't do hours, right? For us, it would be more days if we did hours instead of days on a typical year. Is that accurate? Correct. Right. So this year, because of COVID and because of how we've had to arrange stuff, we have enough instructional time that we could consider hours, which we typically don't. If we do that, then we can still get out on the 18th is what you're saying. Yes. So then we would need a motion to accept instructional hours for this school year as opposed to days. And then we can get out on the 18th instead of the 22nd. Correct. 
Correct. Uh, barring any other um, days. Natural disasters where we can't be remote on those days, right? Because we could still have a national disaster as long as we still had internet, we could have a remote day and still qualify, right? Right. Okay. And for example, um, voting day, um, John Stark will be using, we'll be voting on the John Stark budget and using the where facility um, so that will be a remote day for Upper L and mm -hmm. their middle school mm -hmm. on May 11. But right. that will still count as an instructor. Right. Okay. Do I have a motion for us to consider, for us to use instructional hours to calculate our, our school year for the 2020, 2021 school year? I'll make that motion. Excellent. Do we have a second? I'll second if nobody else does. <laughs> okay. Sorry, so now, yeah. All right. <laughs> so let's have a discussion and keep in mind parents and teachers are watching. Do we want them to go for extra days or do we not want them to go for it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. So do we have any discussion around this? Okay. So roll call vote to accept. Um, hours instead of instructional hours instead of days for the 2020 2021 year. Uh, Christine? I'll say yes. Rochelle? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Wendy? Yes. Okay, so the last school day barring any natural disaster that prevents us from being remote is June 18th. Okay, now we are up to our second public comment. So um, just do a hand raise. You can do that either from the reaction button if you have the newer Zoom, or if you open the participant window, you'll see a little hand by your name, click on that. I've got two already. So uh, Krista. Hi everyone, my name is Krista Edmonds, and I am the owner of Where We Grow Childcare. Um, the child care center that is going without masks for our children and our adults. And I just want to make sure that I clear up a misconception um, that we have had an outbreak. Um, we have not had an outbreak at our child care center. We had one teacher have a positive case in January and we had to shut down because the state requires us to because our children and teachers were exposed and then in February we had at the end of February we had a child um, test positive for COVID and again we had to shut down because the state makes us because of exposure but we absolutely have never had an outbreak at our center so I just wanted to make sure that was cleared up um, and you know just we're doing great without our masks and I hope that um, everybody can come to a agreement that um, is good for everyone. Thank you. Um, Jen. Um, hi, everyone. Jen Pavalio. I'm Meadow Drive and Where. And I just wanted to make a quick comment regarding um, this whole conversation that we're all having about mask usage. Um, just within the past week, the number of cases uh, of COVID-19 that kids have been diagnosed with are kids, um, the cases have increased by 25% in the past week. Um, so there is more exposure. Kids, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, I guess for them, um, when they are exposed, they don't tend to um, exhibit symptoms, um, but they can spread it around. So I think that we need to take into consideration the teachers and the staff that work at the schools. Um, it's not just the kids, but if that's what the teachers and staff need to feel safe to be able to go to work and educate our kids, that they should have that taken into consideration. And that's it, thanks. Thank you, uh, Nicole. Hi, um, two things. One, I 
have kids across the school district in two different schools. And a board member mentioned earlier that kids are all back to playing with their friends. And that's, that's not an accurate statement. I do not have kids at my house that are not living immediately with me. We are still practicing social distancing. We are still practicing mask wearing. So that is not an accurate statement for all parents. Second, as all the board knows, I was one of the biggest supporters of the Learn at Home program. I fought very hard to have that program in place. With that being said, eventually I did send all my kids back to school full time because I felt like it was safe. I felt like our schools were practicing um, safe mask usage. All three of my kids have never had an instance where they're talking about teachers not wearing masks or st students not wearing masks every day they come home and report because you know i'm asking that things are being done properly so from my kids who are actually in school that that usage is being done properly and i did send my kids back to school on the premise that was made to us masks were being worn so at least for this school year and that's all i'm talking about is these next two and a half months I think it's very important that the school board takes that into consideration, that those of us who attend these board meetings, that those parents who are very informed and stay active in this conversation, that those decisions are looked at and upheld, quite frankly, because it is essentially a promise. We do elect a school board based on those discussions being made and we also when we're told one thing that one thing should be abided by with the current situation and that's all i'm talking about is this school year so i have to say it's very scary to hear that there could potentially not be masks for the rest of the school year and the science shows masks work when both parties are wearing masks not one so I really hope that the board takes this into consideration, um, especially knowing everything we do now, masks do work. And there are still some of us out there that are practicing those safe things. And you know we are looking to our schools to keep our kids safe. So I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Jessica. Hi, thank you. Uh, Jessica Fuller. Um, just a quick question. Um, just curious. Um, if a student were to show up to school tomorrow without a mask and then refuse to put one on, what would happen to that student? Good question. I think we probably should start with the principals. Or Je Jess, do you want... Um Jackie, do you want to feel that universally? I'm guessing it's different when we have a kindergartner versus an eighth grader, but. I, I, every situation is different. Um, but if, if they have a documented reason why, you know, they, they can't use a mask and, and they are, have worked, you know, their family works on a plan um, with the nurse on that, um, then, then he goes to school. Um, that's a, not a refusal. Um, what we talked about, if there's a refusal, we work with the family, but refusing um, becomes a behavioral issue. Maybe I can make it more specific because I can, I can use it specifically with my family. Um, my son is deaf, um, has a severe speech impediment, um, is recommended by his pediatrician not to wear masks. And that was one of the exemptions, both federally and state. Um, so if he were to show up to school tomorrow and I notified his nurse and his teacher um, that he is uncomfortable wearing his mask and it is hindering his education, would he have repercussions or be sent home or get a phone call or anything? If there was a plan that the team had worked on, absolutely not. No. Okay, thank you. Priscilla. Uh, hello, it's actually a uh, Steve, but it's on the other account. <laughs> okay, uh, on mine. <laughs> all right. Uh, no, I'd actually, I guess, like to argue against the mask because my kid comes home every day and tells me that he's got a stinking headache 
and he's been unable to do stuff because he's had that mask on his face all day. And honestly, we won't talk about the science, right? A while ago, the Danish did a study, right? When they had 6,000 adults, roughly. I'm, I got it pulled up here. And so after about a month, so 1.8% of the people that wore the masks got infected. The people that did not wear the masks were at 2.1. So arguably, I mean, that's, that's almost nothing in terms of actual prevention, right? And if we go into terms of survival rate, we're looking in the, what, the upper 99s for children alone. I don't think there's been a single case of a child giving coronavirus to an adult and the adult dying from said coronavirus. And I mean, honestly, that's where I'm at. I'm just kind of against it. I am all for the opinion that we should make it optional for people. If people feel the need to wear a mask, right? If they want to go in and wear a mask, then I mean, more power to you, right? Why not? But I feel for those of us that don't want it or don't want to have their kids wear it, they should have the option to not wear it and not only not wear it, probably not be segregated from the rest of the student body in a weird way. If you know what I'm getting at. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, anyone else? All right. Nice long meeting. Uh, let's see. Does so, the board get a chance to comment? I'm sorry. Um, sure. Okay. I just wanted to take a moment to um, apologize for my misspeak about um, where we grow. I was trying to make the point that um, as a parent, it does concern me. And also that as, an, as someone involved in the education system, I do know that a public school system is very different than childcare. I did not in any way, shape or form um, mean to um, convey the false, like I did not mean to make it sound like where we grow is not the wonderful place that it is. I'm happy my children are there. Do I wish the kids were wearing masks? Would I feel more comfortable? Yes, but I know that Krista is doing wonderful things to keep them safe and to keep them healthy, which is why they, you know, have had such great success. And I think that's what we as board members want to make sure we do for all of the kids in our public school, which is a lot. Um, it's a, just a different entity. And so, so I just want to say thank you to Krista and we love where we grow. Um, and I'm really sorry if it came out in any other way than what I was trying to say is just that, you know, if they had to shut down twice, what would that look like at a public school where it wasn't as easy to follow and adhere to rules? Um, so I'm really sorry. And um, I hope everyone understands that. Great. All right, so we're up to school board member reports proposal for future agenda. We have the transportation study. Um, we have the copier analysis, the costs for copiers. Um, and then we have the consideration of removing the mask mandate. Um, is there anything else that we need on a future agenda? No? Okay, so we are going to go to non-public. We have some personnel issues. Um, our next meeting date is May 18th, and it will be in person at the middle school. So we will be live streaming for those who are unable to come. Um, We'll go back to non-public. We'll do um, the non-public thingy. And then if we have to come back and make a motion, we'll do that in public here. But other than that, we're done for the day. So y'all can go enjoy your evening. Okay. So um, thank you for your, your time and your consideration. I assume, Jackie, you're setting up a breakout room. Okay. I think we're all back. Um, so do I have a motion to accept the parent request? I'd like to make the motion to accept the parent request. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay. So roll call vote to accept the parent request. Uh, Sarah? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Christine? Yes. Daniel? Yeah. Wendy, yes. Okay. You don't need a motion to accept um, the nominations. Is that true, Jackie? I, I do need um, the certified non-teaching staff. Okay, thank you. So do I have a motion to accept the certified non-teaching staff nominations? I'll make that motion. Okay, thank you, Rochelle. Do I have a second? 
I'll second. Chair Zinke. Okay, so roll call vote to accept the uh, non -certif uh, the certified non-professional people. <laughs> it's, late. it's really, really late. I know who they are. Um, okay, so, um, so Sarah? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Daniel? Yeah. And Wendy, yes. <sighs> Do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Please, thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second, second. that. <laughs> thank you. Okay, roll call vote to end our evening. Christine? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Kenya? And Wendy? Yeah. Heck yes. All right. Thank you all. <laughs> thank have you. Have a wonderful evening. Yeah. Good night.